Chapter 2 Omeros Hector was there. Theophile also. In this light, they only have Christian names. Placid, Pancreas, Chrysosotum, Maljo, Philosete, with his head white as a coiled surf. They shipped the lances of oars, placed them parallel in the grave of the gunwales like man and wife. They scooped the leaf bilge from the planks, loosened knots from the bodies of flower sack sails, while Hector, at the shallow's edge, gave a quick thanks with the sea for a font before he waded sigh in. The rest walked up the sand with identical stride, except for foam-haired Philosé. The sore on his shin, still unhealed, like a radiant anemone. It had come from a scraping, rusted anchor. The pronged iron peeled the skin in a backwash. He bent to the foam, sprinkling it with a salt hiss. Soon he would run, hobbling to the useless shade of an almond with locked teeth, then wave them off from the shame of his smell. And once more they would leave him alone under its leoparding light. This sunrise, the same damn business was happening. He felt the sore twitch, its wires up to his groin. With his hop and drop limp, hand clutching one knee, he left the printed beach to crawl up the early street to Mark Hillman's shop. She would open and put the white rum within reach. His shipmates watched him. Then they hooked hands like anchors under the hulls, rocking them. The keels sheared the dry sand till the wet sand resisted. Rattling the oars, they lay parallel amidship. Then, to the one sound of curses and prayers, at the logs jammed as a wedge, one after one, as their tins began to rattle. The pirogues slid to the shallow's nibbling edge, towards the encouraging sea. The loose logs swirled in the surf, face down like warriors from a battle lost somewhere on the other shore of the world. They were dragged to a place under the machineels to lie there, face upward, the sun moving over their brows with the stare of myrmidians, hauled up by the heels high up from the tide mark where the pale crab burrows. The fishermen bruised, brushed their palms now all the canoes were riding the pink morning swell. They drew their bows gently, the way grooms handle horses in the sunrise, flicking the tops like reins, pinned them by the nose. Praise him, morning star, Saint Lucia, light my eyes. True bailing tins in them, and folded their bodies across the tilting hulls, then sculled one oar in the slack of the stern. Hector rattled out his bound canvas to gain ground with the gulls, hoping to come back before that conch's colored dusk, low pelicans cross. So that was chapter two, part one. Chapter two, part two. Seven seas rose in the half dark to make coffee. Sunrise was heating the ring of the horizon and clouds were rising like loaves. By the heat of the glowing iron rose, he slid the saucepan's base onto the ring and anchored it there. The saucepan shook from the weight of water in it. Then it settled. His kettle leaked. He groped for the tin chair and took his place near the saucepan to hear when it bubbled. It would boil, but not scream like a bosun whistle to let him know it was ready. 
you heard the dogs mourning whine under the boards of the house, its tail starting to be let in. But he envied the perugs already miles out at sea. Then he heard the first breeze washing the sea ammon's wares. Last night, there had been a full moon, white as a splate. He saw with his ears. He warmed the roofs. He warmed with the roofs as the sun began to climb. Since the disease had obliterated vision, when the sunset shook the sea's hand for the last time, and an inward darkness grew where the moon and the sun indistinctly altered, he moved by a sixth sense, like the moon without an hour or a second hand, wiped clean as the plate that he now began to rinse, while the saucepan bubbled. Blindness was not the end. It was not a palm tree's dial on the moon, noon sun. He could feel the sunlight creeping over his wrists. The sunlight moved like a cut along the palings of a sandy street. He felt it unclench the fists of the breadfruit tree in his yard, run the railings of the short iron bridge like a harp, its racing stick rippling with the river. He saw the lagoon behind the church, and in it, stuck like a basin, the rusty enamel image of the full moon. He lowered the ring to sunset under the pan. The dog scratched at the kitchen door for him to open, but he made it wait. He drummed the kitchen table with his fingers. Two blackbirds quarreled at breakfast. Except for one hand, he sat as still as marble with his egg-white eyes, fingers recounting the past of another sea, measured by the stroking oars. Oh, open this day with the conch's moan, O Miros, as you did in my boyhood, when I was unknown, gently exhaled from the palate of the sunrise. A lizard on the sea wall darted its question at the waking sea, and a net of golden moss brightened the reef, which the sails of their far-off canoes avoided. Only in you, across centuries of the sea's parchment atlas, can I catch the noise of the surf lines wandering like the shambling fleece of a lighthouse flock. That cyclops, whose blind eye shut from the sunlight. Then the canoes were galleys, over which a frigate sawed its sighted wings slowly. In you the seeds of grey almonds guessed a tree's shape, and the grape leaves rusted like serrated islands, and the blind lighthouse, sensing the edge of a cape, paused like a giant, a marble cloud in its hands to hurl its boulder that splashed into phosphorus stars. Then a black fisherman, his top chin coarse as a dry sea urchin's, hoisted his flower sack sail on its bamboo spar and scanned the opening line of our epic horizon. Now I can look back to the rocks that see their own feet when light nets the waves as the dugouts set out with ebony captains since it was your light that startled our sunlit wharves where schooners swayed idly moored to their cold capstans a wind turns the harbor's pages back to the voice that hummed in the vase of a girl's throat oh mirrors now in that section section two of chapter two we've encountered the title of the text oh mirrors and so Try to give attention and see what meaning you attach to it. Chapter, part three. Oh, Miros, she laughed. That's what we call him in Greek. Talking the small bust with its boxer's broken nose. And I thought of seven seas sitting near the reek of drying fishnets, listening to the shallows noise. I said, Homer and Verge. 
are New England farmers and the winged horse guards their gas station. You're right. I felt the foam head watching as I stroked an arm, as cold as its marble, then the shoulders of winter light in the studio attic. I said, oh, Mirus, and oh, was the conch shell's invocation. Mur was both mother and sea in our Antillian patois. Os, a gray bone, and white surf as it crashes and spreads its sibilant color on a lace shore. Omerus was the crunch of dry leaves and the washes that echoed from a cave mouth when the tide has ebbed. The name stayed in my mouth. I saw how light was webbed on her Asian cheeks, defined her eyes with a black almond outline, as Antigone turned and said, I'm tired of America. It's time for me to go back to Greece. I miss my islands. I write. It returns the way she turned and shook out the black dust of hair. I saw how the surf printed its lace in patterns on the shore of her neck. Then the lowering shallows of silk swirled at her ankles like surf without noise and felt that another cold bust, not hers, but yours, saw this with stone almonds for eyes, its broken nose turning away as the rustling silk agrees. But if it could read between the lines of her floor like a white hot deck on cock by Antillian heat to the shadows in its hold, its nostrils might flare at the stench from manacled ankles, the coffled feet scraping like leaves, and perhaps the inculpable marble would have turned its white seeds away to widen the bow of its mouth at the horror under her table from the lair of her armchair draped with its white chiton to do what the past always does, suffer and stare. She lay calm as a port, and a cloud covered her with my shadow, then a prow with painted eyes, slowly merged from the fragrant rain of black hair. And I heard a hollow moan exhaled from a vase, not for kings flundering in lances of rain, the prose of abrupt fishermen, Cursing over canoes. There ends chapter 2.